just just quickly on our results, I, I just go through it and give the highlights. I'd say it was pretty much down the centre of the fairway for us. You know, if you look at the profit result, um, there's some pluses and minuses in there. We got a little bit of a, a help from a provision that we reversed, but also uh, on the negative side, uh, of course, we uh, revalued some deferred tax assets. So all in all, a pretty strong result for us. Great uh, cash flow. And you can see when you go through all the numbers with uh, the cash that we're using to continue to invest in the business, um, and you balance that up with dividends, we're basically cash break even uh, based on last year's oil prices. So even if we did nothing uh, this year, we'd continue to uh, generate additional free cash given where pricing uh, ended up in uh, Q4 of last year. If you recall, in the LNG world, uh, pricing has a three-month lag before it actually gets through to our sales results. Uh, and pleasingly, we ended the year with some really good momentum. Uh, we had uh, 1.5 million barrels uh, of cargoes on the water as of December 31, so we could only book them at cost of sales. Uh, they've now reached their customers. The good news for mm -hmm. us, of course, is that that's now hitting the profit line that will roll into the 2018 profits. Equally, our new projects that started up last year, in particular Wheatstone, um, had a little bit of a tortuous path to, to start up, but we took it down in uh, December for an extended turnaround just to clean everything out after the initial startup. Uh, it's now up and running and it has been up and running since the end of December. Uh, that's train one. It's at nameplate capacity today, so the good news about that is it's really starting to deliver uh, what we hoped it would. Train two, of course, which is the next part of growth coming through this year, is scheduled to start up around uh, June, you know, middle of the year. Uh, train two at this point is more than 95% construction complete, which is great. Uh, the commissioning has commenced, so the, what we call the warm end of the plant uh, is already being washed out and cleaned. Uh, and at this point uh, of the project, if you want to do the comparison between train one and train two, the number of carryover construction items, or what we call the butt list items, uh, is 75% less. So we're, we're feeling much better about where we are in train two. And of course, Woodside is uh, participating in the startup and commissioning process of train two and are taking a number of lead roles. Of course, we've got Dom Gas coming through uh, from Wheatstone towards the end of the year. Um, so they're all on the positive sides. Uh, we will take some production out of the system. Uh, around May, June, as we take uh, the Najimi in up to the Singapore yard for the Greater Enfield project. You'll enjoy Greater Enfield next year. That, that'll be oil, so that will come back, back online about the middle of next year. So you can see the growth path for us over the next couple of years is already dialed in and is already very well progressed. Uh, some big decisions this year. We'll go to feed uh, on our SNE1 uh, phase development in Senegal. Uh, with an FID expected um, around the middle of uh, you know, Q2 of next year. Uh, that should stream around 2022. It's a phase development. We just want to manage the, uh, the capital risk on that. Uh, and of course, um, you probably want to know what we're going to do with Scarborough and Browse. And so the good thing is uh, I don't have to just talk about Browse all the time. I can talk about Scarborough as well. I'll come back to that in a moment because I'm sure we'll have a lot about the equity raising. Just on the markets themselves, um, you know, as we probably discussed this time last year, we saw the market starting to um, starting to strengthen. We thought oil prices would strengthen through the second half of 2017, and, and they did, uh, which is good news. Uh, I think you're at, we're at $65 US per barrel Brent today or thereabouts. That's probably the range that will be in for the remainder of this year. It may dip during uh, the second quarter just as you get some inventory movements around Europe and the US. Uh, but you should kind of see these ranges of maybe 50, it'll be between 55 and $70 this year, somewhere in there. So, you know, the average pricing is just starting to get a floor and starting to get some support and move up. LNG prices um, surprised on the upside over the northern winter. Um, the good news there, of course, they reached uh, more than $11 uh, US on the spot pricing going into Japan. Um, the reason for that is pretty simple, no, just policy change. And you can see what policy change can do. We do it, we see it here in Australia. Uh, we've managed to destroy some power generators over time through some of the renewables policies changes. Um, China's doing similar things and it's been coming for at least the last five or six years. 
uh, was just and has been in their policies, embedded in their policies. Uh, so the switch from um, to cleaner burning fossil fuel was always there. This is not a greenhouse gas issue, but it, it helps, definitely helps. And the Chinese will take credit for it. It's more about quality of life. Uh, and as China's middle class starts to grow, so they've moved out of poverty into middle class, of course, they want the things that we enjoy, which is clean air, clean water and safe food. Uh, those policy changes are irreversible in my view. Um, and you can expect additional growth out of China over the next few years, roughly at about 7% compound average growth rate out through 2025 uh, for gas and LNG. So it's pretty, pretty good demand growth there. Uh, why do I say that? Very simple. Uh, it's not just that the people will demand it. Very simply that uh, the northern parts of China were underserviced uh, during this winter simply because the system didn't have enough capacity to import. Uh, and then equally, for those who you know, may, may have been watching some of the big contracts up in Queensland, you know, there was a lot of commentary last year about the fact that China Inc. was over-contracted uh, with respect to its LNG. Well, that turned around in one year, so they're now balanced. And I would say they're in deficit because they imported on, on the, from the spot market more than 8 million tonnes last year. Uh, so to put that into context, that's more than 20, 20, roughly 25% of their total usage last year. They had to get into the spot market, which drove prices up over winter. That spot market demand was limited because their northern terminals were running at more than 100% capacity. So that's why I'm saying I think there's some more room to move there in China as they uh, furiously uh, start to install additional storage and get more uh, capacity through through the north. Uh, that's good news for us. Um, you know, where's the world going on supply? Uh, all supply that's under construction currently uh, will enter the market uh, over 2018 and in the first half of 2019. Then there is no new supply. All right, and that, that's what happens when you don't have final investment decisions. So there's only one final investment decision last year on a fairly small project, which was 3.4 million tonnes. To meet demand, we need to be uh, putting about 15 million tonnes a year into the market of new supply. So you can see by this time next year, we'll be saying there's, there's nothing coming and, and there will not be any FIDs this year. Uh, so you've got very small last year at 3.4, very, very unlikely to see any FIDs of substance this year, uh, which basically says you're going to a short market pretty soon. Uh, why is that important for Woodside? Uh, very simply, the demand will continue to grow, uh, which is why Woodside's out there, uh, some may say aggressively, uh, preparing ourselves for this new wave of growth so that we can participate in a, in a very, very significant way. Uh, and so that kind of leads to where we're going with Browse uh, and with Scarborough. Uh, the Scarborough acquisition um, is, you know, I hate to word, use the word strategic, because uh, normally when CEOs use strategic, it means they don't know what they're doing with it. But I know exactly what I'm doing with it. So I have a plan um, and I've obviously shared the plan with investors uh, this past week. Um, Scarborough is very important to us. And why is it important? It gives us control. So at a point in time in the cycle uh, where control commands a premium, we now have control over a very significant asset. Now, to put it into context, the production will get out of Scarborough uh, is about 10% on an equity basis, 10% more than we will get than we're currently getting out of Pluto. So if you like Pluto, you'll love Scarborough even more because it's about 10% larger on a net equity basis uh, that will go through the plant. So even though we're only 75%, uh, that's about four and a half million tonnes per year. Well, that's more than we net out of Pluto. So that kind of helps people with size and perspective of what we're doing. Of course, it's very cost effective for us at this point in the market and we're, we're able to leverage the brownfields position that we have uh, in the infrastructure. Uh, why is it important to us and why is control important? Um, pretty straightforward. We've been through basically three years of a down cycle uh, in our commodity price. Balance sheets are depleted and as big corporations, um, the super majors that we deal with, uh, start to look at where they wish to invest. It's very simply, they'll go for areas where they've either got bolt uh, control uh, and they can put bolt on acquisitions into it or where they create new growth platforms. And so in the context of, for example, an ExxonMobil who sold us Scarborough, 
their bolt-on acquisition is into oil. You know, we may think that's large. Uh, I will tell you in ExxonMobil's world that is not large. Um, and it's a bolt-on acquisition to an existing project that they have and being able to leverage uh, PNG, LNG. And then, of course, Mozambique for them, which they acquired last year, uh, is a new growth platform. And once Mozambique gets up and running, it's probably going to be another uh, mega project, uh, f far bigger than um, maybe anything else in the world. So those sorts of things are out there and they play on it. What does that mean? Our projects have got to compete when we have those uh, com uh, companies as partners with them. And so for Woodside to be able to get control of Scarborough, of course, in joint partnership with BHP is tremendous for us because it gives certainty to both ourselves and our shareholders that we will be able to move down this growth path. Why is 75% important? Uh, that gives me voting control. So within the joint venture, the voting control is at 75% up to the final investment decision. Now, final investment decision, it's unanimous, but it means I can carry this through uh, all of the pre-engineering and so forth up to that point. So there's some important facts around that. Uh, Cost-wise, the offshore development's very straightforward. They call it uh, the four Ds, deep, uh, distant, uh, dirty and dry. Only one of those is true. It's not deep, it's 900 plus metres, uh, which you might think is deep, but I'm drilling a well in 2,700 metres of water in Gabon at the moment. So 900 metres is not deep. It's, it's right down the middle of the fairway of what Woodside does in our base business each and every day. Distant, it is not, used to be, but it's not these days. It's 400 kilometres uh, to the Pluto plant. To put that in context, that's half the distance of the ICDS pipeline to Darwin. It's half the distance of the Browse pipeline to Northwest Shelf. And it's the same distance as the offshore section of the Papua New Guinea pipeline that goes down from Hydes to um, Port Moresby. That pipeline in total length is 700 kilometres. So you can see 400 kilometres is pretty much with, within what industry does. Um, with respect to the dirty part of it, it's actually not dirty. You, 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 if you use gas this morning, that's the gas that it comes out of Scarborough. It's very clean. Uh, the dirty part about it is it has nitrogen in it and you're able to put nitrogen in, and you have nitrogen in hospitals. Uh, so you put nitrogen into pipeline gas, you can't put it into LNG. And that's always been the thing that holds it out of the market. The Pluto plant is set up to handle nitrogen. It's, a, it's got one of the largest nitrogen handling units in the world. And so it was designed to handle it. Uh, Northwest Shelf cannot. And so that's why we're putting it towards Pluto. Uh, the dry part of it's true. Uh, it is dry, but the good news about that is it means the offshore facilities costs are much, much lower. You lose it on the revenue side, but it's much simpler facilities costs. And then finally, markets change. Ten years ago, this gas could not have got into a Japanese market uh, because the heating value of it was too low and you would have had to have sold it into India or China, which were closed markets. Today, the Japanese market is open, and that all happened post Fukushima. And that was fundamentally the Japanese then changed their market. They started opening up US supply, which has a lower calorific value. The calorific value or heating value of Japanese gas has historically been the highest uh, in their system, and there's good reason. I can go through the reasons for that at a later time. But bottom line is this gas can now get into market. This gas is not dirty, it's clean, it's not distant, uh, and it's not deep. Um, and it's going to be cheap for us to, to get it in. Um, browse, uh, browse is moving along very well. I expect the tolling discussions on Browse to be complete in the first half of this, this year. So we're, we're very positive about Browse as well. Um, and then finally, our progress towards developing a hub at, at Burrup, on the Burrup Peninsula, um, will progress significantly with this acquisition. You see we're putting an interconnected between the two plants to optimise flows so we can move them backwards and forwards. Uh, and the presentation we put to investors the other day around the equity offering, I would suggest to you, is, is quite simplified with the way that the process flows will move. And there's a lot of optimising that we will uh, start to negotiate around those process flows. So I read that I view that there's even more capacity in that plant, but we had to put something out there that was understandable and commercially at the time, something that we controlled. So that's that's where we are. Um, equity raising wise, very well subscribed. Saw a little bit of choppy trading when we reopened on, on Monday. Yesterday was a much better day. I'm not sure how today will go. 
Um, but you know, generally uh, the instos um, subscribed did pretty well. So obviously, some people trading out of the stock um, and just moving positions. But in general, everybody understands the strategy. Biggest question is, uh, why did you raise so early? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, on the back of the acquisition, we would have been downgraded um, in a heartbeat. We knew that. We brought the ratings agencies into the tent. They told us that, which is why on Wednesday they were able to tell everybody that our ratings uh, had gone to stable from, from negative. Um, and with that sort of pressure, with the fact that we were looking at major capital spend in just a few years, uh, we didn't feel that uh, through the other mechanisms, either self-help or changing dividend policy or so forth, uh, we were able to get our gearing down to the point that we were comfortable with before going into a major capital program. What does that mean is that we probably we would have come under a lot of pressure in the market with respect to capital raising, people starting to uh, wonder when are we going to raise capital. As every, every milestone we reached on the project, it would have, the anxiety level would have gone up even more. And then for those who enjoy dividends, of course, there would have been the debate around, well, are you going to raise, you're going to raise capital, which now means you come equity. Or you're going to cut the divvy, which means I'm not going to give you any credit on the dividend uh, at all because this might be the last one. And so you know how that debate would go over time and it would just build up ahead of steam. Um, uh, and we just said, let's just clear the air. We're in a really unique position globally now with respect to the offering that we have. We are funded. Uh, and so shareholders can be comfortable that, you know, based on reasonable sort of oil price assumptions, um, we won't be thinking about. Uh, a future equity raising for some time, uh, so that uh, and that's been built into the assumptions. Uh, 